pleasant good morning, uh, afternoon, or evening to those of you that are joining us. My name is Kevin Mulhall. I'm a technical customer success manager here at TechSoup. Uh, today, in our virtual office hour, uh, we will be discussing how to reduce risk by managing identity threats. Uh, with us today, uh, we have Linda, and I hopefully I'm going to pronounce your last name, Widop, correctly, uh, from Tech Impact, as well as Francis Johnson. The chat is open. Um, when the Q&A session does come up, uh, you will be able to um, come off of mute uh, and ask any questions that you do have. This is going to be very uh, open and free flowing and topic, but uh, we hopefully can get some good questions. You're also welcome to put them uh, into chat. For those of you that are in need of closed caption, depending on whether or not you are on the web browser version or the desktop, uh, in the desktop and the, near the upper right, there is a three dots that re reads more. If you click that down, the full expanded menu has closed caption there. If you are on the web browser version, if you scroll your cursor down towards the center middle of the screen, you'll see those three dots again. You expand the menu and you will have the ability to view clo cap closed captions from there. Uh, so with that, uh, we're just gonna go ahead and get into it and I will come off of mic and camera and let you have at it, Linda. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everybody. Um, we're like, uh, as Kevin said, we're we're a little bit light on the presentation piece of today's um, session because we are uh, hoping for some good questions and dialogue. So we're talking today about managing identity security. Uh, Francis and I work for Tech Impact. We're a 501c3 nonprofit um, whose mission is to leverage technology to advance social impact. So we provide technology services to nonprofits across the country and across the globe. Um, we, we provide, we do a lot of managed IT support services. We do a lot of cloud migrations, a lot of security work. We have a consulting team that does strategic planning. Um, data analytics and that kind of thing. And we're like a nonprofit to nonprofit tech services. We also offer education and training. So we do webinars and um, research papers. We do, uh, we produce the consumer guides that may, many of you may have uh, downloaded um, for nonprofits. We also run a workforce development program. So we're training, um, young people to get their job, get their uh, start in the technology um, services field. So uh, here's a, a link to our technology Sir learning center. Um, if you want more information about, we, we do have some information about identity management and security stuff right there. So you could just go to techimpact.org and look for our technology learning center. Um, I'm Linda Whitup. I have the Oh, who knows what I am now? The <laughs> Chief Customer Officer. I know, like my title changes. It's all ridiculous. Um, I've been with Tech Impact for almost 20 years, and um, I basically do new business development and manage our account management team. And with me today is Francis Johnson. Look, I got your title right. There you go. Uh, hi, everybody. So, yeah, my name is Francis. Uh, I am the Chief Technology Officer at Tech Impact. And essentially, I just manage a lot of the, the technical side of things. Um, so we, as Linda said, we do provide a bunch of technology services, manage IT support, cybersecurity, uh, infrastructure, et cetera. So I, I manage a team uh, that delivers that to, you know, our nonprofits all across the United States. And, and the thing of the interesting thing is that you're also our chief security officer. That is true. That is true. For our internal, right? <laughs> that is true. Yeah. So you manage all of our internal security. Internal, at, yeah. Right. Uh -huh. So at Tech Impact, uh -huh. we have 110 employees. We have four offices in the U.S. And then we've got people, you know, working remotely from who knows where. And you're managing all that for us internally. Yeah, I am. It's it's a struggle sometimes, but it's yeah, that's something I also do. As you Can said. you turn my multi-factor authentication off, please, so I don't get bothered by that anymore? We'll, we'll take that offline. We'll take that offline. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a no. Okay, <laughs> great. So we have a quick, you know, a, a really short agenda for us today. Um, we're just going to talk a little bit about a presentation that we put together um, so that 
when you if you want to download the recording, like you know, you have some slides to refer to, right? So when at Tech Impact, when we think about you know the different vulnerabilities that um, are out there, we're looking at five major categories of vulnerabilities. There's a lot of nuance here, but all of this is really to protect your information. The whole goal of cyber, you know, uh, cybersecurity protection is to protect that information that you have, whether it be your customer information or your donor information or your cases, you know, confidential information, HIPAA, whatever it is, we want, that's what we're trying to protect. And so we have a, a, a lot of, a lot of things that we talk about around device management, you know, make sure your window, your windows updates and all that stuff, your network or your firewalls and that kind of a thing. Um, policy and training is a big, big one. But today we're really going to focus in on that account and identity, that blue one there. Um, you know, 80% of all data breaches start with compromised identities. I mean, that's been, I've, I've had this slide in my decks for eight years, and it's always the same number. It might have gone up to 85 at one at one time, but it's always been about 80% of all data breaches start with compromised identities. And so you can see why, you know, this is like one of those main things that we really have to focus in on because it's not if, it's when. Data breaches cost a ton of money. Uh, we're talking about dollars here to recover from a data breach, the investigation, the workstation network and server recovery, the user credential recovery, and all of that restoring the data back to normal um, costs, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. In addition to that work that, and, and this is like, this is the part that Tech Impact does. We do all this stuff and, and the, the people who, you know, are on Francis's team are, you know, asked to do this kind of work and we have to charge for that work. So even though we're a nonprofit, we're charging the other nonprofits to do this work because we have to, you know, account for our time. Additional costs could be for legal guidance, breach notification. So if if you know, I mean, we've all we've all had this happen. I think we've all had this happen. I have. I've gotten notification from you know a bank or a you know Home Depot or you know something like that. Hey, we think your data's been may have been compromised. So that has that's that notification that goes out. And then there's that credit monitoring, right? I've I have personally received three years free LifeLock. Um, because my information got out from, I, I think it was my old college. I don't, you know, I don't even know how it happened. Um, and then there's the forensics. If, if we need to, because we're under contract with a government or we're under a compliance where they want to know how it happened, we have to do that forensics. That also cost a lot of money. Um, this is the stuff that Tech Impact doesn't do, but you'd have to hire somebody else to do it. And then there's those intangible costs, right? That especially as a nonprofit, we're talking about lost trust from funders, from donors, from volunteers. If you're an organization that provides, you know, meal assistance and you've been compromised and that gets out, um, a donor might say, eh, I'm not really confident that I want to give my money and my my information, my credit card information and everything to that meal program. There's another meal program down the street. I'm going to start to donate with them. Um, I have I was at a conference two or three years ago where a, a major international um, care organization the guy got up in front of everybody at this conference and just let it all hang out. And he said, we, you know, we were breached and we, you know, had all these servers and all the servers were compromised and locked out. There was one server in our African office that happened to be down for maintenance. It's the only reason that we're operational today. And they, they calculated, um, 
something like $1.2 million in lost donations because once word got out, um, you know, people, individual donors went other places for their, you know, for their, for their donor, for their donations. So $1.2 million, I mean, that's pretty significant. So again, today we're talking about uh, account identity and how to prevent data, data breaches by focusing on, on that. And can I just jump in here real quick? And yes, so I, I want to also just highlight the reason, you know, there's, as Linda said, there's a lot of different ways that, you know, attacks can happen. Um, but if you look at it this way, with devices, networks, systems, et cetera, um, the, the onus is not necessarily on every single person in your organization, right? Not every single person is involved in, you know, patching your, your, um, your network firewall, for example. But every single person in your organization has their unique, you know, email address and password or username and password. And so that's the, the surface area, so to speak, to attack is very, very large. And, you know, depending on how big your organization is, obviously, and the onus is on the on the person and the individual. And that's why it's very important. It's not the most important thing, but it's the things that we like to really, you know, hone in on and explain. And so we're obviously going to jump into a few slides to, to dig in here. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. Thanks. Um. So, you know, I, I account and identity management, you know, what what are we talking about here, right? We're really just talking about providing access to systems and data. And one of so Francis chief technology officer, um, you know, some chief customer officer or whatever. But we really need to also talk about this from an a human resources or an HR perspective, uh -huh. because employee on it, onboarding and offboarding, right? We have to make sure that our new employees and new staff have a policy that is presented to them, that they understand and that they agree to in terms of, you know, computer use policy and that kind of a thing. But the HR person and the technology person need to work together to make sure that we're doing the right things, providing unique accounts. And that's hard for a lot of nonprofits. Sometimes we need to get into these systems that cost us a lot of money. And we go, you know what? Instead of buying 10 user licenses, we'll buy two user licenses and we'll let everybody share them, right? And so from a data, you know, a, a identity perspective, that's not a great idea. Um, creating passwords and making sure that everybody understands that they have to have a uh, pass, you know, 16 characters or whatever, it, you know, whatever it is with upper and lower and weird things and all that or pass phrases. Um, and, uh, and having centralized account management, right? This is back to that HR and IT director. You can't let everybody be an admin into every system because then, you know, things go awry and we don't really have it locked down properly. Um, using password management tools, multi-factor authentication, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this and single sign-on would be a good idea. Do you have anything to add here, Francis, that uh, I missed. No, no, this is this is good. I mean, it's it's everything we're we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper into. Yeah. But yeah, you made a good point about you know the account management. The unique the unique accounts are very important, even though sometimes it might not seem feasible. It is important that every every person that logs in has a unique uh, authentication against the system. And we'll dig in a little bit about that, and obviously talk about that throughout the throughout the presentation but yeah we can we can move to the next slide though great yeah i mean so for password practices you know i i think this is pretty you know common knowledge right yeah. make sure you can you know make your passwords as long as possible on the last slide i had 16 now i have 20. Mm -hmm. what's the what's the going right here it's it's well it depends on on what standard but yeah between it's between, it starts at 16 i think 16 is 12 to 16 is is usually where uh most uh most systems you know prompt folks for 12 to 16 and then the upper lower alphanumeric etc um, do you agree with the use of passphrase or would you rather just see a jumble of nonsense 
No, I think that the reason you do a passphrase is so that it's easier to remember because the other po the problem with complicated passwords is that it is hard to remember. And I think we're going to talk about how to help with that in a, from a tool perspective. But the reason you do a passphrase is so that you can actually remember to type, you know, you can remember it so you don't have to write it down on the infamous notepad on your on your computer screen, <laughs> right? Because that's not what you want to do there too. So the passphrase thing is really for the, the end user to be able to have a long password and also not forget it and therefore have to write it down because you never mm -hmm. want to write down your password, right? Yeah, and and the the number two thing here, don't do not reuse passwords. A lot of the systems that we use will not allow us to yep. use an old password. Like if it says, you know, create a new password and I try to put an old password in, it kicks me out and says, nope, you've already used that. You have to choose a new one. Right. Mm -hmm. I mentioned I mentioned earlier that I got I had it. I received a notification from like a college that I have like, you know, look at me. I'm old. I haven't been in college in a long time. Right. But somehow my user credentials got out. Um, that's a good reason. Right. If I if I if they stole my old username and password into my old college, you know, login and some years later, I start like it's not good. So uh, I'm OK, right? They got my my they maybe got my name and, uh, you know, information. But when they tried to put that old password in somewhere, it's no longer valid anywhere, except if I start to use it again. So if they've already gotten it and I start to use it again, then now I just open myself up again. So that's no good. Um, you know, don't share passwords. Unless you absolutely have to. I can't think of one reason why I would absolutely have to share a password with anyone. I don't need, Francis, you don't know my passwords. And you don't, don't know anybody's to. password. You're the, <laughs> chief, yeah, yeah, you're the yeah. chief security officer. You don't need passwords. And yet I have customers that constantly say to me, by the way, if you need to know all of our passwords, I have it in a spreadsheet. No. What? <laughs> Why would you need to do that? No, yeah, exactly. Right. That is not the good. Yeah, that's not a way to to manage passwords. There's there's definitely better ways to allow people to manage their passwords. But yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I know a guy who doesn't have any password manager. He doesn't have any passwords written down. He never reuses the same password. His passwords are always twenty plus characters long. How does he manage that? Because every time he logs into his system, he hits the forgot password button. <laughs> every single time he logs in, whatever the system is, he hits forgot password. And then it sends him an email and it says, gives him a link that says create a new password. And uh, he goes in there and he just puts a jumble of whatever it is in. Next time he goes into that account, forgot password. Hmm. How's that for a tactic? Right. Yeah, I can see some holes in there, but we can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead. So, yeah, the last thing yeah. on this screen is multi-factor authentication, and uh, you know what? What is multi-factor authentication? You would you like to explain this, uh, Francis? What? Yeah, what yeah. Is it? In its simplest form, it's just a another way, right? Factor to authenticate against a system, right? So we talked about passwords, right? And so you put in your username and password, you've basically, that's your first factor of authentication, right? Uh, in order to bolster up your security and making sure that, again, you, if you have a compromised password, that basically opens up the door to whatever system you're logging into. In order to at least add another level, you you turn on something like an MFA. And MFA is multi-factor. You've probably heard about 2FA, which is two-factor. Um, multi-factor is really the more um, secure way to even do that because you want to do you want to be able to do more than two ways if possible. So the second factor in this case, or uh, is proof that you basically prove that you are who you say you are, and that password is not compromised. You you can use something like a uh, mobile app that you can basically push to push to use an authenticator on. Um, it is not. I don't really recommend this, but this is something that, that a lot of systems still allow, which is an SMS text to your phone, et cetera, email, wh wherever wherever you can uh, basically have set up to essentially send an additional layer of uh, authentication to. 
Uh, and then, you know, if you want to go beyond that, then it's you can do things like, you know, conditional access with multi-factor. So it's not just that you put in your password and that you authenticate it. You also have to do something like be using a specific device or be in a certain location so that there's really additional ways to prevent uh, a compromised password or a compromised phone number or whatever to, to allow somebody to get in. So, yeah. And and the the theory behind multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication is that even if a criminal got your username and password, they probably don't have access to the physical device that yep. you would want to get that to, right? So they don't also, in theory, they don't also in have theory. your cell phone or they don't also have your laptop. So, you, you know, that's the way that they can do that. Um, and, and as the chief security officer, you're managing all of our internal things. Do you see that if that happens? Like, do you see um, cyber criminals trying to bang up against our, like trying to log into our accounts unsuccessfully because they don't have the multi-factor authentication? Is there like a log that you can see on that or? Absolutely, yeah. So we, we use, um, Microsoft 365 for most of our, our systems uh, internally. Um, and so there's additional tools within the 365 stack and they have a security stack and have a bunch of add-ons, et cetera. And that allows us to not only, you know, react to certain things, we can actually see things as they happen. So in this month of October, which is Cyber Security Awareness Month, but it's also a, a really uh, busy month for hackers, uh, we've been really getting hammered uh, on our tenants specifically and um basically understanding where things are coming from so i can see where you know attempts are coming from and they all fail uh, mainly because they do not even have the first uh, attempt which is the password so nobody's right. password is right. compromised and therefore it's just failing at the first attempt and there's a bunch of things that happen when once that happens we have you know account lockouts and things like that so yeah i mean being able to monitor that and see how it's going and basically even if so in the really the question comes down if somebody were to compromise or have access to any of our internal accounts the the attacker would get in the first with the first factor which is the password and then they will be basically prompted with an mfa prompt right and then i can at that point then there's a bunch of alerts that come out because then it's it comes down to uh somebody just logged in with linda's account from you know North Dakota, and that's not where Linda is usually. She's usually in the Philadelphia area, unless Linda just traveled to North Dakota, you know, five minutes from when the last time I talked to her, that's a very bad, you know, that's a <laughs> weird location for Linda to show up all of a sudden. And so there's yeah. an alert that goes out. And in, the, in addition to an MFA prompt, there's also an alert and a mechanism behind that that essentially locks Linda's account down. So there's a bunch of things that happen that can happen on the background too to assist with the user experience as well. So mm -hmm. and and the more sophisticated stuff isn't available in every multi-factor authentication system. Yeah, but there's definitely some yeah, there's features that can be added and you know, it's it, it's one of those things that because it's not, you know, you know, if but when uh, it becomes basically a necessity to look into just adding as much as possible to those things that can stack up and allow for more security, more and analytics, more insight into what's going around, uh, you know, what's happening in and around your systems from an authentication perspective. Yeah, cool. Great. So from multi-factor authentication to single sign-on, right? Yeah. Single sign-on, I, I talked about the HR person, I talked about HR and IT, right? As a user, a single sign-on means that we have an application that a user logs into, and once they log into that application, in the background, they're logged into all of the systems that they have, um, you know, that they're allowed to log into and they have access to, right? And I like, yeah, you know, like I like single sign-on because from an HR perspective, we put it on the human resources manager when they're onboarding the employee to know which 
um, systems that particular employee is allowed into. So if they're not in the finance team, they don't get into the finance you know, system. They might get into right. Microsoft or Google or whatever, and they can set all that up. The IT people can create usernames and passwords to all of those systems that are really strong, right? That strong password, and then give the employee one place to log in. So for me, we have single sign on it. I have Microsoft 365. I have Paycom for my payroll and time off request. I have Concur for my expenses. I use HubSpot and we have an internal system called Harmony, right? So I have like seven or eight different things that I log into. And with single sign on, I only need me personally, I only need to know my Microsoft 365 username and password and get the multi-factor authentication thing from one. Once I log in there, I'm logged into everything else with the same password, even though on the back end, Francis's team has set me up with some ridiculous long password, right? So that's single sign on. So from an HR perspective, we can really manage who has access to what and not allow them to set up these accounts on their own. From a security standpoint, we know that all the systems accounts have really great passwords on them. But from a user's perspective, I don't have seven post-it notes. I only have one post-it note. I'm kidding, Francis. I have no post-it notes because I know I, my- I, I knew you were joking. I, <laughs> I, I, I've heard this joke before. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anything to add about single sign-on? Yeah. So, well, a couple of things. Uh, Kevin actually just put something in there. So, like, so we're talking specifically Microsoft 365. You can you can use a Microsoft 365 or Google Workspace. You know, as your system, they have single sign-on capability. Or you could get get a third-party identity manager like a Octa or a, I got yeah, that. I'm, I'm Octa, drinking out of the mug. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and this, the other folks like Okta that also can layer on top of you know your 365, your Google, or whatever system you use. So that's one thing. Um, so single sign-on is very, there's a lot of benefits to single sign-on. The, the, the flip side of it is, as Linda said, once you get into one, basically once you get into the Microsoft account, you have access to everything, right? So it's kind of like the key that opens up a bunch of doors. And so with single sign-on is very, very important to make sure that the security of whatever identity manager you go with, whether it's with the Microsoft Azure Active Directory or Google or even Okta, that those accounts are secured because they are essentially the, the key that opens up a bunch of different doors once you log in. And so yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the piece of it, right? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so I think this is our last slide, and then we can jump into questions. Mm. Password managers. Password managers uh, allow the, you know, I said I had seven post-it notes. I don't. I have a password manager, right? So every time I do need to set up a new account, like even for my personal banking and all that stuff, right? I put all that. My, uh, I could tell you the one I use the most often is my American Airlines frequent flyer password. Um, you know, I I just have to have it in a password manager because this way I can I don't use the same combo for multiple um, systems, right? So that's for me personally. You want to talk a little bit about like th these are the three big, you know, the three main ones, right? Dashlane, which I think you can, I know you can get through TechSoup, LastPass which a lot of people know about and use. And then the other one, Keeper, that maybe not a lot of people on this call are for, as familiar with. You wanna talk a little bit about those password managers and any differences yeah. that you might think? I mean, they, they all essentially do. I mean, they have different features from one to the other and, and whatnot, but I mean, from a just a core functionality pr perspective, it, it allows the person as we said, you know, we started off with the passwords and the complexity of the passwords and what you're not supposed to do um, in order to take all of the, the the hard work of figuring out your 20 plus character password. You use one of these things, right? You use one of the, the tools that we, we have on this slide, right? So they it allows you to generate a password. It, 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 it basically securely saves it into your vault. 
and it basically gives you a, a quick access to it. it. All of them have, you know, um, browser extensions. So if you use Chrome and you have to log into a bunch of websites differently, you can basically have them attached to um, uh, Chrome or, you know, Edge or Firefox, whichever browser you like to use. And when you go to the website, you can essentially, you know, take your password and, and populate it securely using one of these uh, provider's extension. So it really, yeah, it's really just uh, allowing you to, you know, check off some of these security controls specifically with your password without putting a lot of burden on each and every one of you. This is the tool that allows that to happen, right? And so it's it's great. And, and you know, it's not really just for your organizational use. You should use it on your personal use as well. Like you, you have a lot of accounts, you have your bank accounts, you have et cetera. This is a good way to make sure that every single account, your individual accounts and your organizational accounts are secured from a password uh, protection perspective. Great. I know Chris likes Keeper because it will it has centralized administration for the IT yeah. person. Yeah. So yeah, like Keeper has the, the enterprise version where you basically can uh assign uh users you know your your staff members each their own vaults you can manage that it's easy to onboard and offboard somebody and allow them to to create it and you know just from a management perspective also allows you to as an organization uh, essentially force this type of behavior and basically roll it out to everybody and have them actually use it um it, yeah so it's yeah some of some of them uh, yeah keeper definitely has and i believe dash lane as well yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Cool. Good. So we're on to the questions uh, part of the session. I think we did pretty good time wise. Um, we have yeah. about 25 minutes left in the session. So I'm going to stop my screen share. Um, and then, you know, uh, Kevin, I don't know how you want to open it up for questions. Um, just unmute yourselves or how does that work? Yeah, we actually have uh, two questions that came in. Um, I'll start actually from Jim and Nathan. I'll start with uh, Nathan because um, you kind of did just speak on this. Do you have a recommended password manager? Um, our team currently uses LastPass. Uh, we've 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 done a lot. We've seen a lot of good things with with Keeper, right? We've seen a lot of good things with Keeper. Um, they have a good price point. Uh, I think they have nonprofit pricing. Um, and you know, the I think the big thing about password management is that coming going back to how you're looking at it from an organization perspective, you want something that you can manage and centrally manage if you can. Something you can roll out. Something you can basically allow everybody to have access to and and see how you know basically onboard and offboard et cetera so um just in terms of like what we at tech impact usually have had the most success with i would say keeper uh, i think dash lane is set, would be fine too if, if you wanted to evaluate dash lane great that kind of goes into jim's question and this is actually a really good question i think francis and you could definitely speak on this is mm -hmm. what about browser based password managers? Mm. That's interesting. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm guessing you're thinking like a Google Chrome. So like with Google Chrome, you basically if you have a Google account, even if you don't, right, you can essentially use the password manager on Google Chrome. I think Edge has its own as well. Um, OK, so the the only issue, well, there's a couple, but the one that I, I like to call out is the fact that because the browsers also run into a lot of vulnerabilities. So I don't know if you, you know, if you've been looking at the news recently, Google Chrome has had a lot of, a lot of call out in terms of vulnerabilities, yeah. right? And so basically, <laughs> if 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 you don't update or you, if you're not updating your browsers as much, and you know, we, I'd be real, like unless you're closing and uh, closing out your browser every day after work and open it up and allowing you know google to update it automatically you're probably you know you probably have the red update right I, there's so many times i work with a client and i they're using a google and there's the big red update like update uh, option on google chrome you if you're if you're somebody that updates your browsers regularly and making sure that you're on top of things in terms of vulnerabilities Sure, but I, I think the problem there is that if you're not, and essentially your, you know, your your Chrome and your account, your Google account, and your Chrome account is is exposed, and then you have a bunch of passwords that are just lying there as well. 
there's there's you know there's basically a bunch of risk attached to that as opposed to having something that's separate even though it might have an extension on chrome it is separate and and not you know involved at all in terms of how the how chrome's vulnerabilities work so i like to separate some of my if you think of it i like to separate systems if you can right that put everything in a one a one system that you know so like that's why you would probably do something like an Okta for single sign-on as opposed to using everything in Microsoft 365. Just making sure that there's enough enough separation. Um, we call that air gapping, so to speak, so that that if some if one of your systems were to be compromised, maybe not by yourself, but the, the, the vendor itself, you at least have something separate so that everything doesn't go down at the same time. And that's the same when you're looking at your network or anything like that. So um, I would just be careful about using a browser password manager uh, for some of the things I just mentioned um, and just keeping it in a separate and a secluded uh, system like a keeper or dash lane or LastPass. Yeah, they went on, uh, Jim followed up a password manager from Okta that's integrated yeah. as part of it. Yeah, I totally, Francis totally hit it on the head is that needing to have that degree of separation if you follow anything in security news, all these Chromium browsers, Edge, Firefox, Chrome, the amount of attacks that they face yeah. uh, is just overwhelming. So yeah. I got another question here from James. Any comments on Norton 360 Password Manager? I haven't used it, but keep getting reminders. <laughs> keep getting reminders. <laughs> okay, it's not that you laugh first. It's not a bad thing. It's all of us keep getting those reminders, and it's yeah. the thing that we just kind of That's put hilarious. off, it seems like, yeah. as much as we can. Yeah, um, I haven't evaluated Norton in a while, to be very honest. So I can't give a you know a straight up answer about it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a direct answer on it. You know, I laugh because we all have dealt with Norton in some capacity, um, but I haven't looked at their password uh, password uh, manager system yet. Uh, so I can't say yes or no to whether you can use it or not. Um, yeah, I I used Norton. Uh, it's it's now called Norton LifeLock Password Manager. I use that on my you know personal. Oh, so you do okay. for my How personal it? stuff. It's fine. It's easy to use and and it's pretty secure and you know and and quite frankly, for, I it's free. I think I might have gotten it because of that data breach that I referred to earlier. Like I th I think you know the college was like, hey, you know, we're sorry for the breach, sign up for all this stuff. And I did, and it was, you know, I like it, it's easy to use. It's not an enterprise solution though, yeah, right? Yeah, it's yeah, it's for my yeah. personal stuff and it's where I keep my bank account stuff and my frequent flyer stuff. So that's all I have really have to say. Okay, uh, looks like we cleared out the uh, Q&A portion here. Um, let me see if there's anything else question-wise in the chat. And it doesn't look like there is. Uh, I did want to close, as I mentioned um, uh, earlier. Um, oh, actually, somebody put their hand up. Uh, Stephanie, you're welcome to come off of uh, mute and ask your question. Up in the chat, or your Stephanie, if you can toss it in the chat. Um, your microphones are enabled. Um, recap on single, single serve, single, single sign, sign on, sign on, maybe. Yeah, I think that's what. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, I can, I can speak to it again. I, it's. Uh, Essentially allowing, um, oh, well, you stopped sharing the slides. I thought the slides were pretty good in terms of just giving you a breakdown. But essentially, it's allowing you to um, easily give, give your your end users in your organization a good experience in terms of logging in, right? So it's from a just a practical perspective. You have a single sign-on provider that is attached to other web applications. Uh, Linda mentioned we use Paycom for HR things here. We use um, Salesforce, we use all these different applications. Instead of us having to log into each one every day or each one every time we need it, uh, we essentially log into one system that has access 
that can give us then secure access to the other systems. And so it helps with onboarding and offboarding easily. So it's not just about giving access. We can also take away access pretty quickly, right? So that it works both ways. Uh, and I think from a user perspective, it's 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 so much better. I mean, I think when we in implemented single sign on Linda, everybody was like elated, right? <laughs> like it's, it's it's a totally different game, ball game yeah. in terms of logging in with one account that has access versus having to log in each time, each have several tabs, have several authentications, have several MFA experiences, et cetera. And so mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of benefits in it. I also mentioned quickly that there's a flip side to that, which is it, it, you have to make sure that whatever system you go with or whatever identity provider that does single sign on that you basically pay attention to the security of it because it's it is a one one login not a one login but it basically one access gives you access to a bunch of other things so the key that opens up several doors and so with us you know because of that i'm like we, we have a lot of alerting we have a lot of policies we have a lot of mechanisms behind the 365 account because that's the that's the main account that will give you mm -hmm. access and single sign on to other accounts. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can remember back when I, we're Tech Impact. If if there were only three letters that Tech Impact would be allowed to use to talk to anybody, it would always be MFA. Right, like multi-factor authentication. I, it's all I hear, you know, anybody at Tech Impact talk about with our customers about how important it is to have multi-factor authentication. Okay. And I could tell you that years ago, when we rolled out multi-factor authentication internally at Tech Impact, I grabbed one of these knives. No, I didn't. I grabbed a dull one. And I chased people around the office and told them to turn it off or I would kill, I would stab them with a dull knife because I wanted it to hurt more. I'm from Philly, right? I mean, we do that kind of stuff in Philly, right? Not everybody does it. Um, but like, it was the worst day of my life. The worst day of my life, technology speaking, was when they turned on multi-factor authentication and I had to fumble around and try to find my phone and do all this other stuff, right? The best day of my life, was the other three letters single sign on SSO, right? When they put SSO in, I was like, oh, this is wonderful, right? Because I only have to do the multi-factor authentication thing once. I don't have to do it seven different times for seven different systems. So it was terrific. Great. One thing I just, 30 seconds, just curious to get some feedback is, this was brought up in the session of the future work that I spoke at was, um, FIDO keys. Like this is probably something that might be a little alien to some people, and it might even be beyond like a general need. But like, is there any value? In what did you call it? I, we I think we missed it. FIDO, 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 FIDO security FIDO. keys, mm -hmm. or even FIDO like the dog. FIDO, yeah, uh, fast ID online, uh, like yeah. the the biometric. Plug -in so keys. the little keys that you can pop into yeah. a laptop yeah. or okay. yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, or even just biometrics like Windows Hello for Business. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, is this something that you all are seeing more people adopt or so of any value or is it more probably work than the benefit proposition? Oh, no, no, I don't. I Well, uh, that's an interesting way to put it. But I, let me just say personally, I think it's the way to it's the way we should all go right the password less it's basically the password less movement right let's get away from these 20 plus characters even though we just did a whole presentation on it um <laughs> like let's get away from like typing in passwords and let's do a different way of like you know authentication right as you said fingerprint biometric stuff i have a fingerprints thing in my on my laptop that i'm on right now i don't i never type in my password i come in i Put in my fingerprint i authenticate again against against something again with my fingerprint so i don't actually type in my password unless i'm in a browser for example which that hasn't changed yet but yeah to answer the question i think it's definitely it's been a push for a while the fido keys have been around for a while it's it's interesting because we've actually had some clients recently that have had conversation about the keys but you're right. It's not just about the keys. It could be facial recognition, right? So a lot of your a lot of your laptops are coming in not just with the biometric fingerprint scan, but there's the the webcam that can scan your face. Obviously, for the longest time, I think um, 
with with Apple with their iPhone, you could do that right now. Things like that. So how how else can we authenticate other than having to figure out this very old process of figuring out and setting up a password that is 20 characters long? And yes, it's it's been the future. I think it really should it will be the present soon. I would I would hope. It is a it is if if nothing else, it's a change management thing. I don't think it's necessarily a technology thing. I think the technology is absolutely already there. There's things that can obviously be approved upon, but it's a shift. It is absolutely a shift. And I think getting everybody on board with doing something other than what they've been doing for how many decades now is probably the bigger, the bigger impediment, so to speak. Um but yeah, I mean, to me, to me right now, and I just gave you my experience with my laptop, I don't ever have to put in my password. And so I'm kind of there already. Uh, I think there's other things to have to do after you log into your actual device. What else can you do with the with the web browser at, at logins and things like that? But ultimately, uh, I am all for it if that's if that really was the question and and really moving our moving our clients right now and just moving everybody towards that, I think is there's nothing but beneficial things in my mind when it comes down to passwordless uh, authentication. Thank you. That's a great insight into uh, that. Yeah. Uh, is there any like uh, hardware like hardware limitations on that? Like, oh, you know, it has to you have to be on Windows 10 Pro or something like that yeah, for these yeah. things to work, you know, for I sure. also so wonder about that. Yeah, Windows Hello. I mean, there's definitely process, right? So there's Windows Hello only works with certain there's certain OSs. Obviously, everything that they support they have to be pro. You got to be joined to Azure Active Directory, things like that. Um, and so there's obviously some technical pieces there, uh, but it's it's not something that has to be recreated or something that's not already available. It's yeah. all about adoption, as I said before. It's mm -hmm. like, are we can we adopt it quick enough so that everybody can start? benefit from benefiting from it so to speak yeah because i mean Kara's in the chat asking about you know do do we recommend 365 for mfa and you know the answer to that is yes if you're in 365 you know yep. then then you should also be adopting azure ad and doing cloud join for your workstations and mm -hmm. but there's a limitation to that you have to be in windows 10 pro for that cloud join debt to and and Azure AD to take take effect, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yep. and using Intune for policies and mobile device management. This is all part of the 365, you know, ecosystem, if you will, um, which requires, you know, you have to you have to know your licensing. Uh, you know, basic multi-factor authentication you can do with any Microsoft license. If you want to start to get some of that sophisticated um, you know, setup that we were talking about. It requires an EMS license, right? Mm -hmm. Which is mm -hmm. included in business premium, mm -hmm. the AM EMS. But if you're in a different, you know, the enterprise versions or whatever, then you're gonna have to connect mm -hmm. in with the EMS licensing. So there's a lot to it, um, yeah. but it, it can all be done. Yeah, I, you're right. I think the cost is important. I don't. I don't want to brush off that there's some cost involved, <laughs> for sure. I, like a lot of this, the, a lot of the things I'm talking about have additional cost involved. Uh, you know, ultimately, you know, every any vendor you're working with, not just Microsoft, has will have some type of technology like this. It's just a matter of whether it's part of the, you know, the basic basic package, which it usually is not. And what it, what does it cost you to go up? To the next level so that you can actually adopt some of these technologies yeah right so you you do want to consider that you also want to consider you know i mean we make our living on the professional services to set that up right so mm -hmm. if you don't have somebody that's technically capable or or you know familiar i shouldn't say te technically but technically familiar with this new technology Mm -hmm. um, hiring a professional to help you set it up properly and even manage it for you ongoing is, yep. you know, uh, it really, you really should don't fumble through it yourself because the worst thing you can do is try to set this up and lock everybody else's system, <laughs> right? That's for true. days that's or something true. like that, right? And yeah, that's, this is a lot of information. It's great. Um, it's, Seems like covering all the bases here. Um, so with that, um, 
taking a look at uh, everything looks like it's wrapped as far as Q&A and in the chat. So to you, lender Francis, if an organization believes that it's in need of further review of its security and would like to connect with Tech Impact, how would they do it? You want to best, put your, way to, uh, best way to do it is just Linda at techimpact.org yeah. and I'll I'll get you to the right person. Yeah. Let's we put have, it in the chat. Let's put your email in the chat. Yeah, yeah, just toss it in there. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I had a pre-prepared yeah. statement, so I don't want to get yeah. across. Yeah. So no, it, it's yeah. great. I mean, we have if if we had done this, you know, if we had done a webinar, you know, what four years ago, five years ago, it would have been me, Francis, and Francis would have been the security team at Tech Impact. Now we've got, what, six people on the security team, yeah. um, you know, because that's how important this is. And, you know, again, six years ago, it would have been, we we would have done everything custom. Now we've done so many multi-factor authentication setups and that, you know, it's it's relatively low cost to, to do this because we have a process that we can take you through. We have a, a security assessment. You know, it's a low cost security. We call it sec check, 450 bucks, right? Go through questions and answer and get a, you know, kind of kind of get a score and some recommendations. We also have a seven or eight or $9,000 security risk assessment, which is a more in-depth thing, right? So we just run the gamut there. Don't be afraid to call us. Um, and ask us your questions, you know. Fantastic. Well, I think with that, um, we've, we've kind of hit our time here and covered a lot, even though it was a small number of slides, like you said, Linda, yeah. uh, I, <laughs> this, is, this obviously goes very deep. This is a very important subject matter. You can't escape the news now without hearing phishing, the words ransomware, et cetera, yeah. uh, just all over the news. Um, you're not alone in the journey. TechSoup, Tech Impact, we are here to be stalwarts for you. Uh, you're not alone in this. The contact information for Linda is posted in the chat. My personal email is in the chat along with the customer success team. Um, you feel free to reach out. This this is something that's I think I think people are moving a little bit beyond like the discomfort with it and recognizing that support is needed. So just you know if you feel it's necessary. Just, you know, take that next step, you know, engage with us um, and we can make sure that your organization uh, is safe and secure in this crazy, uh, new, brave new world that we're in. Yep. So, all right, well, with that, um, we wish everybody a good afternoon, a good rest of their morning, of course, depending on where you're at. Uh, a copy of this recording will be available in the upcoming days for all those who registered to attend. With that, take care all. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.